I don't think we're ever going to stop learning. Uh, and I don't think we ever should because you need to be innovative in this industry. You need to think of new ideas, new concepts that can make things more efficient, uh, make things, you know, more aesthetically pleasing, more cost effective. I mean, try to balance all these things. Episode 134. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Have you ever thought about developing your own project? You know, have control over the design and reap the profit from all your hard work? Today we'll be speaking with the CEO of one of San Diego's premier boutique urban residential developers. It's the second half of my interview. His company designs, develops, and builds beautiful contemporary single and multifamily projects, which both add to the local community and they also make great, beautiful spaces for people to live in in San Diego. Sohail Nakshab is the CEO of Nakshab Development and Design Incorporated. In this episode, we're going to talk with him about how he's grown his design build develop company into one of San Diego's premier boutique urban residential developers. On this episode, you'll discover the secret government backed loan program that will let you develop a fourplex property with as little as three and a half percent down, how to get started out as an architect developer, how to figure out a good development opportunity versus a bad one, and Sohail's step by step process for figuring if a project pencils out. And with that, Here's today's show. So what would you say, you know, uh, I have a show of architects here and you know, you probably understand how architects view engineers and engineers view architects, you know, um, they might be shocked to see the, the beauty and the detail of the buildings you've designed as, as a, as a, you know, you have a background in structural engineering. So I guess, like you said, you made the point that you sort of blend the technical and the design side. Tell me about your growth just in terms of the design from when you started till now. Oh, I'm still learning. I think I learn every single day. I don't think you ever stop learning. Um, you know, just uh, getting in and being hands-on, uh, being able to have the power to be a design builder, you can physically alter your details in the field, and we've done that. Or even, you know, interaction with other professionals in the industry, uh, learning from them, hey, you should try it this way. Modify this. Did you think maybe you could make the detail like, you know, like that? All of this has played a part in in our development as far as detailing. And I don't think we're ever going to stop learning. Uh, And I don't think we ever should because you need to be innovative in this industry. You need to think of new ideas, new concepts that can make things more efficient, uh, make things, you know, more aesthetically pleasing, more cost effective. I mean, try to balance all these things. Do you find that because you build a lot of your own projects that you're able to uh, spend less time on the construction document side? Definitely. I mean, when you do design build, you're basically, even even when it's for a client, you're taking responsibility. Yep. You know, I can't come and point fingers at myself and say, oh, I forgot to show this detail the way it should have been shown. Or he forgot to uh, uh, build it the way I wanted him to build it, you know? So <laughs> I'll end up doing whatever I need to do because I love our projects. You know, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. You, know, you get to create something. You just drew on a piece of paper and you physically get to experience it and you physically get to watch other people experience it in their interactions with the space and environment. So it's very stimulating to go through that process. Mm. So say you have, I have a lot of, well, say you have an engineer or an architect who's experienced, they've, they've worked for other people for a long time and they want to get into this business. What advice would you give them to get started? 
I don't think they should jump ship from where it is they're working. I think that they should, you know, take baby steps. Maybe, maybe it's a small house that they do for themselves as their first project to create uh, a name for themselves. Uh, or maybe it's a, a small, you know, rental property, a duplex or a fourplex um, that you can get some good financing opportunities as, uh, you know, as someone that's just entering this industry. So I would definitely take baby steps, try to keep the sense of security that you need while you're taking those baby steps so that you don't go upside down um, in the process and ask a lot of questions. I mean, talk to people that are in the industry within your community um, and get, you know, help from them, get advice. That's what we do here in San Diego. We have a large community of uh, people that are designers and developers and you know we, we we communicate with each other we have coffee together we talk about hey what did you do here do you have any advice for me um and i think all that goes a long way what's the process for someone now if you're going to take a project through to completion sort of give me a rundown of how that's done in terms of the timeline as far as the design through from idea well just let's say from idea because i find that people find it the most well first of all money is usually the biggest obstacle is i have these great ideas i don't have money but then you know where would someone start to try to get some financing how does that work okay let's start with this first i think if you have the background of an architect or an engineer uh you have a sp special tool there that you can apply which not everybody has and what you can do with that tool is you can find more complex, complicated sites that most people won't even look at. You take that complex, complicated site, buy it for a reasonable price, and turn that into your first project. And that's something that we've done. We, we've gone after you know, hillside canyon lots that no one wants to touch. And the beauty of those sites is it actually lends to the architecture. It adds more beauty to the architecture because it's not just a flat lot. So um, that's one piece of it. Um, as far as financing, I, you know, there's this one program that I went through, which a colleague of mine turned me on to a few years back. Uh, it's called a 203K loan. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, you can go through Wells Fargo for this financing, and they will lend you money for uh, both the purchase of the property and the construction of the property. It could be up to four units. So let's say it's a single family home, but it's zoned for four. They'll lend you for that. Or if it's a six unit property you're buying and you're going to have to downsize to four units to convert it into larger units. And the beauty of this loan is the, the down payment is very minimal. So one of the projects I did, it was a three and a half percent down payment. I literally put $28,000 to make this fourplex happen. I bought the property, I got the construction, part of the financing, built the whole thing, $28,000 out of my pocket. And the way you qualify is they apply the income that you're collecting from the other three units. So they they look at the loan like you will actually physically be living on the property as your primary residence. So one unit goes to you, the other three are income. So that's how you can qualify as a young person or someone that is just getting their hands in the in the development side of things excellent hey let's talk about some of the projects you're working on right now so or, or that you've done in the past what's some of, what's one of the funnest projects that you're really proud of i love um the cheyenne house i named that one after my son i'm a big fan of mid-century modern architecture i just i think there's just some just beauty to, to that style and that era and just the simplicity, the minimalism. Mm. And, uh, it's funny. Uh, a lot of people that have toured that project, they actually thought it was from the mid century era. Mm. So that's a great compliment. I, I think, you know, I mean, as long as you like mid century architecture, <laughs> that was a really fun one. Um, the other one that we recently finished is uh, Sophia Lofts. That one I named after my daughter. And the cool thing with that project is we took that concept of multi-generational living that we physically have experienced 
living in one home as a family, going to a fourplex as a family. And now what we've done is we wanted to bring that avail, you know, that type of experience to others that are not blood related. So here, here's an intergenerational environment. We're going to create this interesting hub, this interesting indoor courtyard community that all the units will look out onto, create interacting space. Uh, we put in an outdoor movie theater where we host uh, movie nights once a, once a month for, for everyone to gather and kind of interact. Um, it's a cool property. It's a boutique property. Um, we, you know, the site that we ended up doing that project on, it could have, uh, we could have put about 40 units on it. But again, we're not all about the density. We're not just about the bottom line. We want to create something that's better for the community and that creates a cooler environment for people to live and experience. So those two are definitely on my top to the top list yeah cool yeah it's uh making it so you're making an impact so i'm looking at the sophia lofts right here tell me about the project how many units are in this project if you generally so that, if you uh, there's a historic home on the site that um i fully gutted and restored i'm 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 into keeping the past just to show people where we were and what we've evolved to um and i create i i i I made it a focal point so that the historic home uh, is at the centerpiece of the property. Uh, there are two adjacent sites that each house eight units for a total of 16. So there's 16 plus the house, total of 17 units on the property. Um, they all surround this, in this courtyard space um, that has communal features. Uh, the units are, it's a mixed group of units. So we have, you know, single story studios on the ground floor for elderly people because we don't have an elevator on the property. We have two bedroom townhouses. We have two bedroom flats. We have larger studios. So having this mixed variety of, of units on the property uh, allows us to broaden our spectrum as far as the types of people that we can expose our property to versus just creating a cookie cutter environment where it's only one type of person that would be living on this property. So we have retirees living there. We have young families living there. We have young professionals living there. And we've already had people kind of uh, grow in place. So they've gone from a larger unit and downsized to a smaller unit because they didn't need that much space anymore. Mm. It's kind of interesting. Mm. Well, what I'll do here is I'll, uh, for those of you listening to the show right now, uh, hop on the YouTube video of this because I'll um, see if we can splice in some of these pictures. Who took the, the photographs here? Do you take them in-house or do you have a photographer do that? No, so the photos that I had professionally done, there was two different photographers. Uh, one of them is Paul Bodie and the other one is uh, Rob. I forget what Rob's last name is, but there's two different photographers. Okay. Yeah. Would, would we be able to splice these into our interview? Go ahead, please. Yeah, okay. just to, if you need us to send you anything from uh, our office, the originals, let us know and we'll do that. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Well, we've been talking today with Sohel Nakshab. He's doing design, build, develop down in San Diego. I hope everyone has had an enjoyable time. Sohel, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with about your experience that you think would be useful uh, to my audience of primarily architects who, you know, we do have quite a few people who would like to get into development and you already gave us some really good suggestions about how to get started. Anything else? Create a plan for yourself. You know, I think if you apply yourself, you can hit your goal. Uh, communicate with people around you that have, done, have been doing it, have done it, learn from them and apply their tricks to the trade that'll help you excel and get to the point that you're trying to get to a lot quicker. Now here, before we, before we finish up, there's a question I have for you. I know that a lot of times real estate developers, um, it's sort of a robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of deal. Like a lot of the income producing properties out there and eh, they might not produce that much income. It's sort of like you kind of hold on to them. You hope to sell it to someone else, make a profit, flip that into the next property. You know, what's, what's been your experience about doing this just from the, the financing side of things. I mean, is, is it possible? I'm, I'm kind of struggling here to form the question, but when we're talking about cash flowing a property. Yes. Uh, if you're occupying the property, there's bonuses if it's your own development. So, you know, you obviously aren't 
charging market rents to yourself. So that's a added plus. Um, depending on where the property is, I mean, within San Diego, we're getting rents upwards of four dollars a square foot for for rental properties. It's ridiculous where the rental market has has jumped here in San Diego. So there are a lot of opportunities. Another trick, I mean, within our climate here, if you are looking at developing a rental property, you know, the number you want to look for as far as the cost of land per unit is about fifty to sixty thousand um, dollars. So you need to figure out what that cost of land per per unit needs to be within your environment that you live in. So you're not burying yourself right off the bat. Um, yeah, I mean. And it, you know, initially, yes, you're going to probably develop uh, your first smaller income property, stabilize it, um, and you're going to turn it on and sell it so you can take that money and, and go to the next project. And then at some point, you're going to reach, you're going to be able to hold on to these projects, and you're not going to necessarily need to to sell them to go do more. You'll create a track record for yourself. You're, you'll you'll create confidence with the uh, institutions that you're getting financing from, or they don't have the conservative restrictions that they did originally with you for the financing. Could you take me through the process of what uh, what you look at when you're looking at a property? You just gave us a rule of thumb, which was, okay, I'm going to look at spending fifty to $60,000 per unit for the land. You know, If you're looking at a piece of property, what are you evaluating to determine if that's going to be something that's possible for you guys? So you're looking at the density. You're looking at, okay, let me pull up the zoning density for this neighborhood. This is the size of the property. Uh, parking is a big deal. You know, in our city, you have to provide parking for all your, your units that you provide. So you got to look at all these variables and say, okay, this is how many units I can actually fit on here. I'm spending this much money. What does that equate to dollar per, per unit as far as my initial cost of buying this land? Um, and then from there, you want to you wanna be able to tabulate, you know, these are my soft costs. If you're designing it yourself, great. You're putting sweat equity in. Um, obviously you'll have some consultants that you have to pay. Uh, so you want to figure out what those expenses are. Um, and then you want to research to see what the cost is, uh, associated with, with plan check and building permits. So factor all this in, um, and then move from that category into your hard cost category. You know, you really want to want, you're going to want to put a lot of time and energy and detail into the hard cost category, because the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a situation where you've under budgeted the project or neglected to think about some component that you needed to put in. For example, one of my first developments, uh, I didn't budget for a, a dedicated uh, fire sprinkler system uh, that it cost me $25,000. So fortunately I had a contingency and I wasn't tapping into the contingency with other items, but I had that contingency that protected me. So you mm -hmm. have to be careful with what you're doing. I know you know Jonathan Siegel yes. down there in San Diego, and he's he's a big proponent of using uh, his soft costs, his fees, throwing them into the mix and using that as equity in the project. How do you guys deal with that? Do you have a similar model? What do you guys do? We do. So uh, the institutions that we've dealt with, basically what they'll do is uh, require canceled checks and invoices that actually show we have put that equity into the deal. They won't really count sweat equity. Um, they will count any soft cost expenses. So if you've actually physically paid for a civil engineer or you've paid for plan check, they'll apply that to the equity that you need to inject into the deal. Okay. So it sounds like from your position, uh, you're not getting out of injecting any cash. What you're probably getting is a project that has a little bit, that's a little bit less expensive because you're, you're saving, saving, um, costs on your own fees. That's right. I mean, we, you know, the fact that we are the licensed contractor, we are the licensed design professional, we're able to minimize our expenses and put that on the back end once the project is complete. So, you know, there's an advantage of doing your own projects. You okay. can you can set some of these costs and in turn what that'll do is it'll minimize the amount of equity you're gonna have to put in with the institution that you're trying to get financing from. Yep. Well, Sohel Nakshab, thanks for joining us on the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? 
If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a -a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.